Yes, hello, welcome everybody to this new video. Hello, Glenn. Hi, Enric. Hi, hi. Um, today we want to talk about a country who is not so very well known for most of us, including me. Uh, it's in the Far East and that is uh, South Korea. The things we know about Korea is that Korea is divided in the North and in South Korea. Uh, the North Korea was uh, supported by um, the former Soviet Union and has tight relations to China. Uh, South Korea is protected by the US administration. South Korea is a high technological country with several companies who are very well known uh, like LG Electronics, uh, Samsung, uh, they're producing cars like uh, Kia and uh, Hyundai. And uh, South Korea has around about 53 million citizens. So it's a big country in <laughs> when you compare it with European countries, maybe not in Asia. Um, South Korea is a country we not hear so much about when we talk about geopolitics, but uh, you, Glenn, uh, think this is a very important topic and that's why we are talking today about South Korea. Um, so Glenn, you have written also a book about uh, South Korea or a chapter about South Korea because it was important for your book. That's right, or? Uh, yes, that's correct. Well, the book is called uh, Russia's Geoeconomic Strategy for Greater Eurasia and uh, South Korea is considered to be an important part of this Greater Eurasian Partnership. And uh, um, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so for those reasons, uh, uh, I focused to some extent on South Korea, although this is not my main uh, focus of study, obviously. Okay. When when we talk about South Korea, what is important to know? Of course, when we talk about the uh, the future, we also have to talk about the past. What is the current situation in South Korea when it comes to geopolitics? Um, they have relations to the US, of course, but they have also relations to Russia and China. Uh, what is this about? Can you tell a little bit about that? Well, in the past, I guess the world was a bit more neatly uh, divided. Uh, so, as you correctly point out, in the 1950s, you had this uh, war between uh, communist Northern Korea versus the capitalist South Southern Korea. Um, so being a civil war, but also bringing out foreign uh, powers, so sponsors, primarily United States versus China uh, on their territory. Now, the Korean Peninsula obviously still remains divided. And today the U.S. you know, still has 28,000 troops there, which are with the main purpose or only purpose to defend against a possible North Korean attack. Uh, but during the Cold War, this was very clear, um, you know, the, the communists on one side, the capitalists on the other. Uh, but now, after the Cold War, uh, things have changed. Uh, obviously, um, it's very common now to see the, the the president of South Korea stand next to Xi Jinping of China or Vladimir Putin of, of Russia. So they, you don't have this clear ideological divide, even though the United States is very tr hard trying to portray a world divided between liberal democracies and authoritarian states. This is simply not the case. Uh, for one, China and Russia, obviously, uh, have a great interest in cooperating more and more with uh, South Korea and furthermore uh, both China and Russia are well they still maintain good relations and influence with in North Korea but uh, it's not a relationship they're very happy with uh, they, they, this is not a government they would like to uh, support and, and not not take its side against the South Koreans either so the situation is is quite uh, is different now but even in more recent time, we can see that the relationship is changing now because we see the South Koreans uh, trying to distance themselves a little bit from the United States uh, to repatriate some of their foreign policy, if you want. Because uh, obviously throughout the Cold War, when you had this strict division, um, they, much like their Japanese uh, counterparts, uh, outsourced a lot of their foreign policy to the United States. Uh, now they're seeking greater autonomy over this policy. and. Uh, uh, mainly, I would say, for two reasons. One, uh, the United States would like to use its presence in South Korea not only as a, uh, um, a deterrent against the North Koreans, they would like to convert this mission into a, a front line against China. This is not something that South Korea wants. And also, uh, you have um, 
the US diplomacy towards North Korea is not really producing much change and uh, South Korea would like to take a more independent, uh, thus also more friendlier approach to the North. Now I thought that this is an interesting change happening now in South Korea because uh, from where I'm sitting in Norway, it's kind of the opposite here. We have been we're outsourcing more of our foreign policy towards the Americans by opening bases. In South Korea, they seem to be pushing the other direction, that is, uh, seeking to repatriate some of its uh, policy making and take a more yeah, autonomous approach uh, towards that, both China and mm -hmm. North Korea. But that's a really difficult situation for South Korea. We see the tensions between uh, US and China arising. Um, so it's a difficult standing point for South Korea or not? Uh, and, uh, it, uh, it began to change under Obama when he obviously said they would have this pivot to Asia, which meant that America would focus more on Asia as, as the main theater of foreign policy uh, or foreign powers uh, competition. Uh, but uh, well, both Trump and Biden, I would say, followed the same path. They have a little bit different approaches. Trump wanted to make America great by, you know, not being too generous towards allies. Biden would like to make, you know, um, the West great again. Uh, so by seeking, relying more on its foreign partnerships. But uh, the end goal is still the same. It's continued U.S. Uh, dominance in the world, uh, which requires this shift of power towards Asia. Um, and this explains a lot of the policies that is uh, the United States now they're trying to draw down their presence in the Middle East, but also uh, de-escalate or uh, reduce tensions in Europe in order to focus more on East Asia. And what they want to do in Asia then is to mobilize their partners in this region against China. And obviously in the northeast of Asia, you have South Korea and Japan as being two very important allies. Um, mm. So... Uh, <clears throat> Yes, this is why uh, this, there will be more pressure from the Americans mounting on the South Koreans to effectively be part of this, uh, yeah, this coalition against China. But and how is the relation? Bridge, sorry. Breaking, breaking. Uh, sorry. Uh, this <laughs> is obviously where the interest of the United States and South Korea keeps breaking apart because this is not an in interest of the South Koreans. Um, but especially I, I can imagine when it comes to economy, uh, South Koreans are very close connected to China. There is a report from the RAND Corporation from last year, 2020. And there they write that the diplomatic ties between these two countries, China and South Korea, was first uh, started in 1992. And it rises from friendly cooperative relations to in-reach strategic cooperative partnership in 2014. Um, so it looks like that China is a very important partner for South Korea. Oh, definitely. It's his most important uh, trading partner. And uh, and this is why uh, their foreign policy also needs to shift a bit. Uh, obviously, the, the South Korea has done quite well under the patronage of the United States. Uh, in the 50s, this was a you know a country which had been colonized by the Japanese. It was a, a you know torn apart by war. It's a, incredibly poor. But if you look at uh, South Korea today, it has grown quite uh, powerful for its uh, you know me medium size. It's uh, um, yeah it's uh, yeah an excellent economy, very modern. Uh, if you look at it within area of high tech and automation. Uh, they're the country number one in the world in terms of uh, robot density, which means you know the amount of robot per citizen. So they they're very much automated. Uh, yeah, everything they are, uh, they're really at the front line of this uh, high tech, tech uh, high tech economy. So and at the same time they have uh, linked themselves closer and closer to China economically. And um, and this is not really that problematic for them. Unlike the Japanese who have. Uh, bad history with China and you know, a lot of mutual animosity, you don't really have this with the Koreans and the Chinese. Uh, if anything, whenever you have polls coming out of South Korea, um, what are the sentiments towards China? They're, they're so often split between the US and China if they would have to choose. Uh, but the polls always demonstrate that the South Koreans are much more suspicious and hostile towards Japan. Uh, again, the same reason as China has been, this historical uh, yeah, Japanese imperialism. So, so, so this idea that the U.S. can mobilize Japan and South Korea against China, it is problematic when South Korea is more concerned with Japan than they are with the Chinese. So, um, 
Of course. Yes. So yeah, so this economic uh, interdependence now with the Chinese, uh, you know, this huge market is obviously a huge driver in terms of uh, influencing the the South Korean foreign policy and their willingness to make themselves a front line for the Americans against China. The close relations between South Korea and China. Um, South, no, China has also very tight relations to North Korea. Did this make or create any problems for the South Korean government or is it beneficial for them? Uh, well, it would, uh, if, if, if China was uh, prioritizing North Korea against South Korea, this is an ideological case. Uh, China is uh, you know, seeking peaceful and cooperative relations with the South Koreans, and uh, same as the Russians, by the way. And, um, and to some extent, it also makes them better at diplomacy. I would point out that early on, uh, when the Russians really wanted to only integrate with the West, they began to cut a lot of ties with authoritarian governments, such as the North Koreans. Uh, what they saw then was their influence in North Korea uh, dwindled, and as a result, the South Koreans lost a bit of interest in Russia as well. And after they regained a lot of this partnership with North Korea, they got a lot of influence in North Korea now, they're more interesting to uh, the Russians are more interesting to interested yes, sorry, interesting to uh, the South Koreans. So it's it's not this simple ideological barrier where you know they see Russian and China for that sake uh, having choosing between one or the other. It's exactly the ability to work with both sides that makes uh, their diplomacy uh, possibly a bit more uh, efficient than mm. the Americans have quite poor relations with the North Koreans. Uh, what kind of role uh, Russia plays in this? Um, there is also a strategic partnership between China and Russia. So Russia is on one way connected to this issue or not an issue, but it's uh, to, to this relation uh, between uh, China and South Korea or, or didn't they? Uh, yeah, so for Russia, there they are the Russian and South Korean uh, strategies and economic interests are actually a, a perfect match. Uh, as we've discussed before, in, from 2014, uh, Russia, uh, to a large extent, abandoned this uh, Greater European Initiative they had, and instead have been pursuing Greater Eurasia, which entails this abandonment of its 300-year year, uh, Western-centric foreign policy. So it now seeks to link its economy less with Europe and seek to diversify, so connect itself more with Asia. And uh, Russia is very careful that it doesn't want its pivot to Asia to simply become a pivot to China. It wants to diversify in Asia as well. And through this prism, South Korea is like the perfect country for Russia. I mean, it's uh, in, in Northeast Asia, it's uh, it's better, it's easier than both China and Japan because well, China is 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 very big. It's not a problem, but but it is a consideration. And Japan largely outsourced this foreign policy to or to the United States. So. South Korea is a perfect country for uh, for Russia, for because and also the other way around because South Korea is a high tech country and it's energy hungry. And meanwhile, Russia on its side has all the energy in the world to export to the South Koreans, and it wants to modernize its economy. So it's very interested in high tech cooperation with the South Koreans. So there's an excellent match there, and also for the South Koreans, they want this third alternative. Uh, being stuck between the Chinese and the Americans as the dominant economies, it's always good with this additional tie towards the north, which is with the Russians. And uh, just yeah, briefly extending on that without going on the rant, I would also point out that um, this greater Eurasian partnership with Russia envisions uh, the South Koreans have a similar one in mind. Uh, they call it uh, the Eurasia Initiative. And uh, it, it effectively sees uh, three formats of integration, um, uh, which are mutually beneficial, so or three-layered integration, if you want. On one hand, they want the trust building on the Korean Peninsula between North and South. Uh, on the second layer, they want uh, more uh, cooperation and peace in Northeast Asia. And last, they want uh, economic integration of the entire Eurasian continent. Now, all of these are uh, uh, mutually beneficial and reinforcing. So. So when the Russians say, let's integrate the whole Eurasian continent, this is well pretty much exactly what the, the South Koreans uh, want as well. And, uh, and you can't really do that without the Russians. And the Russians would love to make its eastern regions more developed. And, 
And this is possible by making North Korea more or less like a bridge between Russia and South Korea, ideally, obviously, unifying as well. But the, Amer the Russians are pushing this um, trans-Korean uh, railway, they're pushing trans-Korean uh, gas pipelines, also building out their ports to have this uh, yeah, uh, connection with South Korea uh, and not you know, becoming too reliant on a, let's call it an unreliable North Korea. So there's a lot of efforts to connect this economy closer and closer with South Korea. And this is uh, something the South Koreans are very eager with because uh, South Korea is effectively a de facto island because it is only land borders with North Korea. And this is uh, now been to some extent, uh, well, uh, cut off. If they have these poor relations, they, they, they are sit on. So the relationship between South Korea and Russia is, there's a lot of reason for optimism there as well. Okay. <clears throat> so we can see as more the US pushes these countries and uh, European countries have also sanctions against Russia and against a lot of other countries. Uh, um, then the relations and the cooperations between these countries in Eurasia will only be more and more tight and uh, more developed. Do you think the South Korean government can stand against this pressure from the US? Well, that's the difficult aspect. Because of the conflict with North Korea, uh, South Korean um, security is very much dependent on the United States. As I mentioned, there's 28,000 troops. Uh, American troops in South Korea and uh, they function as a deterrent against North Korea now and and they they, they, they still uh, as long as relations are bad with the North they still need this American presence and that uh, well makes them a bit vulnerable to pressure and as I mentioned this uh, um, the Americans have well as a quietly opposed a lot of this railway gas pipeline electric grids that the, that the Russians have a uh, uh, push to connect with South Korea. Now, they don't really like it because they see North Korea as possibly benefiting, but possibly also the, uh, if the economic uh, dependency of South Korea changes, they're also afraid this could impact their political loyalties. So, mm. um, But so, is, it, uh, is it realistic that there will be a new war between South and East Korea, um, North and South Korea? Another war between North and South? Yeah. Well, Every now and then you have, uh, not so much recently, but you have uh, shelling and uh, there are small uh, conflicts. This could uh, easily uh, yeah, get out of hand. So um, it, it does depend. I mean, under uh, they really need to get the diplomacy going again. And it, it kind of stalled since the Obama era because during um, Trump's era, he, you know, he, he went out uh, hard against the North Koreans. So he didn't meet uh, with Kim Jong-un of North Korea. So first it looked like he might, you know, pushing to change the entire relationship with the North. Uh, but uh, because they also sucked up all the oxygen in the room, uh, effectively all relations between South and Korea went through then America because Trump was taking such a big stand. Mm. But then uh, effectively he, he wasn't, he didn't want to make any concessions, no compromises. So the whole thing just stalled. They did this maximum pressure strategy. So nothing ever happened and diplomacy kind of ended. Uh, now that uh, Biden is uh, taking this uh, very hard line also against North Korea, but without meeting them, uh, South Korea is recognizing that there's some, uh, some vacuum to be filled, which it can now begin to uh, yeah, pick, up on the the, pick up on the diplomacy with the North uh, somewhat autonomous uh, without relying on the United States, uh, which could be uh, an ideal approach, given that the US and South Korea, their interests, economic interests, as well as security interests, uh, are diverging to some extent. Mm. But then for South Korea is beneficial these uh, tight relations to China and to Russia, because in this way, these two countries have also relations with North Korea. So maybe this way is a better way and more practical for diplomacy between uh, North and South Korea to use um, the chi China and Russia instead of the US and play on this way you can be more independent from US troops. Yes and uh, again so so yes yeah, so that was one of the, the, the two reasons I think why the, Nor the South Koreans are seeking a bit more independence in their approach to the North. Again the first was they don't want Nor South Korea to effectively change, well the Americans to change their mission in South Korea from 
deterring North Korea until, you know, uh, containing Russia. But the second, obviously, is that they see uh, U.S. Uh, diplomacy as being stuck. It can't really go anywhere because uh, U.S. diplomacy often consists of yeah, threats and ultimatums, while cooperation tends to mean that uh, North Korea should make unilateral concessions. So we often see this, that the United States demands North Korea gives up its nuclear weapons as a sign of goodwill before uh, agreements and concessions are made. So if that's the starting point, give up your nuclear weapons before we start talking, uh, diplomacy will never actually move. And uh, again, uh, this is not really something that the South Koreans uh, are too happy with, because obviously North Korea is a country. Uh, uh, most of the criticism against North Korea is very reasonable. However, that being said, North Korea also does have legitimate security concerns. So mm. remember back, it's 19 years now already, yeah, in January of 2002, you had uh, President uh, Bush of the United States, he presented his Axis of Evil speech, which uh, yeah, seemed to borrow some elements from Reagan's uh, Evil Empire speech, and he effectively identified Iraq, Iran, and North Korea as this Axis of Evil. And uh, in this rhetoric, obviously, it implies that peace is created when good defeats evil. Uh, very simplistic, you know, it's good, good for propaganda and all. But uh, but the year after the acts of evil speech, you know, the U.S. invaded Iraq. So if you're sitting sitting in Pyongyang in North Korea, you know that your security requires a proper deterrence. Now, if you were advising North Korea, what would you say in 2003? You would say, you know, get yourself a nuclear weapon because. After it's your only the, insurance. <laughs> yeah, because the unfortunate lesson of all these American wars have been that countries like Iraq and Libya, who abandoned their nuclear programs, they were invaded and destroyed, while in countries who acquired nuclear pe uh, weapons, such as Pakistan or North Korea, once they had those weapons, they were left alone. So the demand that North Korea should abandon its uh, nuclear weapons before we start even talking... Uh, then they would need something from the other side, some reassurances, you know, the U.S. pulling back some of its troops, removing some of its hardest weapons, ending all these military exercises along its borders. But the U.S. refuses all of this. They will not do anything. First, the North Korea has to remove its, uh, its ability to deter. But, you know, you, as anyone would understand, if you give up your ability to deter, the Americans have no more reason to negotiate with North Koreans. They could very easily strike them. So, uh, so you don't have to like North Korea, but you do have to recognize that they will act in their own interest and they do have security concerns. So this uh, unwillingness to make any compromises or recognize that they have legitimate security concerns uh, has resulted in U.S. diplomacy uh, becoming stuck as they, there's no room for uh, maneuvering. Mm. Um, and this is what the South Koreans aren't too happy with. So if they can... You know, uh, as they say now, they don't want to participate in American uh, military exercises, for example. This is something that they can do independently to uh, you know, reach, give a you know olive branch to the north. So, uh, so there are a lot of strong reasons, both towards the north uh, and China, why the South Koreans seek a more independent foreign policy. Let us take a look back one more time to the U.S. What will the U.S. do? Um, in tensions with China and Russia, they need a kind of ally in the Far East Asia. Um, if South Korea tries to be more independent, uh, so the relations between these two countries maybe are not so stable. Uh, what will the U.S. do? Uh, of course, always impossible to see in the future, but uh, what do you think? Well, the main U.S. objective now uh, is well obviously it defines the rivalry with China being the m most important one and it, the, the main playing card the United States has is that a lot of these countries are dependent on the US for security and what it wants is to convert a lot of the security dependence into geoeconomic loyalty you know so what they would like for South Korea to do is uh, uh, to join this uh, campaign or alliance against China if you will because the US is now very actively trying to mobilize the re region against China. So this is the main objective, get them on board, which means also having an independent foreign policy, the, the South Koreans that is, is not necessarily in the interest of the United States. Now, this is not just the US, this is how, this is the dynamic of block politics is, uh, you know, you work to contain an adversary and then you make the allies dependent. Uh, now, unfortunately, 
uh, block politics, they, the structures tend to survive when there are tensions, because this is what makes the, the, the allies dependent. And, uh, uh, and so I would say it's not necessarily in the U.S. interest to reduce tensions uh, that much with the North Koreans, because if the South Koreans don't rely on American troops against North Korea, then well, wh why would they be there? Um, and this also applies to the, uh, just an extension of that logic, it, it applies to the uh, possibility of a future unification. Obviously, there's uh, good reasons why North Korea and South Korea would not just seek to improve relations, but finally unify. But the unification, uh, it's very hard to see how that would how that could happen uh, with the U.S. maintaining its current present, because if there would ever be unification, it would mean North Korea would have to abandon some of its nuclear weapons, but at the same time, the U.S. would have to gradually uh, withdraw from, from the region. And this is not something the U.S. can do. Uh, this is also important for the regional dynamics, because if you're going to unify Korea, you need some support by the two main regional powers, which is China and Russia. They have both borders with the North Koreans. And... Uh, again, they're not too happy with North Korea either. They wouldn't mind seeing the Korea unify. The main problem is they look towards Europe. And what was the lesson when communism collapsed there? Did the Americans say, well, the mission is over, let's go home? No, they, they began marching further to the east towards the Russian borders. So this is what the Chinese and the Russians are worried, that if there would be a unification or North Korea would collapse, well, not only would you have a refugee crisis, but most likely the American troops would merely march north instead of pulling out. So they would like... Uh, you know, not rely on some Gorbachev uh, uh, reassurance that NATO won't expand an inch to the east. They would want real reassurances, uh, not trusting any uh, only words on the paper, but that the Americans would actually leave and not uh, establish themselves on the Chinese and the Russian border. Yes, of course. Um, maybe Gorbachev did a mistake and rely on the assurance of the U.S. government. Um, so both uh, Russia and China do not want to do this mistake again. Um, it's a very important and interesting topic, South Korea, and many important countries are involved. It's uh, Russia and China and, of course, the US. Uh, Glenn, do you have something to add to this topic? Uh, no, just at the source of this, there's a change of... Uh of interest, which are primarily economic, uh, but this is then, uh, so, so again, as mentioned, uh, China is increasingly, well, already the most important trading partner for South Korea, and this uh, trend keeps uh, continuing, but also it's important with Russia, with its ambitions in the East, it's important to recognize that uh, this uh, railway projects with Russia, the, the, the new ports with Russia, um, you know, South Korean uh, possible inclusion now in the Arctic, uh, these en common energy products, there's a lot of efforts to to have this mutually beneficial cooperation in the region. And as all these uh, interests uh, can continue to increase, uh, yet yeah, South Korea's interests uh, will continue to uh, differ more and more from the United States. And at the same time, while uh, the economic interest of South Korea is changing quickly, at the same time, uh, the United States is, is trying to change its own mission in the region, which is uh, become a bulwark against the Chinese. So. Uh, so there's, um, uh, well, something has to give here. There's been uh, a lot of interest now in South Korea to, to uh, well, not, not abandon the American in favor of the Chinese, but effectively not partaking in this new Cold War and taking more autonomous position where it will work with both sides. And uh, uh, unless it repatriates some of its foreign policy decision making, uh, it, it this won't really be possible. So I think... Uh, at the time when the U.S. is pushing the South Koreans to fall in line, I think you will probably see the opposite. You will see South Korea increasingly seeking uh, to, yeah, the, to take an independent foreign policy. So, um, so it's hard to say to see uh, how this will, will will play out. Okay, Glenn. Um, it was uh, very interesting. As you said in the start, you have written a chapter in, in your book about that. This book is already, how old is it? Some years ago? Uh, it was uh, 2016, but... Uh, Not so but, old. Uh, but, but all of the predictions uh, I made uh, have, have been following, uh, as I said, so it's still uh, uh, still relevant information, I would say. Okay. 
We will do all the information about this book in the description box down below. Thank you for watching. We'll see us again very soon with a new video. And uh, please subscribe our channels on Rumble and YouTube. And take care. Goodbye.